Now, you might have heard this phrase that God is living inside of you. God is living inside of you, which is, sounds kind of strange. If you're newer to church, that probably sounds pretty weird. Like, do we actually believe that God is physically living inside of us? Like he has a little home inside of our hearts. You know, you might have heard the phrase, uh, if someone puts their faith in Jesus, that they've invited him into their hearts. Do we actually mean that literally, or is that just kind of a metaphor? Or if you've been coming to church for a while, you might have a better understanding of this phrase and know that it has something to do with the Holy Spirit and, and God's presence. But the truth is that there's actually a really cool backstory to this, this phrase, this idea that God is living inside of you. And we have to go back to the very beginning of creation to understand it. You see, the Bible is the story of God's presence moving closer and closer to us over the course of time. And the Bible is a collection of books that all tells one singular story. And that's kind of the big idea behind this story is that God is pursuing us with his presence. It's really a story about him moving closer and closer to the people he created, the people that he loves. You know, God has had several places over the course of this story that his presence has dwelled, that his presence has been, that, that he has lived among his people. And so in order to understand this idea that God is living inside of you, I, I want to take you through some of these key moments where God has moved closer to us and what it's really looked like and, and where God's presence has dwelled here on this earth. Remember, this is all about God's desire to be among the people that he created. And speaking of creation, let's talk about the first place where we found God's presence. It was in the Garden of Eden. If you open your Bible to the very first page, you'll see God creating the world and everything in it. He literally creates everything that you can see. He created all kinds of cool stuff, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. Uh, and and he, the last thing that he created was humans. He created you and me. He created the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve, who you've, you've probably heard about. And you might be thinking, okay, Joey, we've, we've heard the story of creation before. But there's something really important that I want you to catch about this story, which is that God's presence was in the garden with Adam and Eve. God's presence was there. They were living among the presence of God. They had a relationship with him. They walked with him and they talked with him and they were truly with them. And God placed them in this garden to run around, hang out, and, and be naked, basically. Um, now, you, know, you might be thinking, okay, we've, we've heard this story before, but you have to understand this important truth. They were in the presence of God and they had a relationship with him. Well, unfortunately, Adam and Eve broke the one rule that God gave them, which was not to eat from the fruit of this one specific tree. And as punishment, they were cast out of the garden. And the thing you have to understand about this is that that they were leaving the presence of God. They were being cast out of this perfect paradise where they were able to to be with God and, and know God and have a relationship with him. And they were literally being cast out of his presence. And the rest of the story of the Bible is about God's presence basically trying to restore that relationship that we had, that that perfect relationship, that perfect place that we had in the Garden of Eden. The rest of the Bible is about restoring that presence. God wants to live among his people. He wants to live among us. He wants to be with you. He literally has a desire to be with you. And as we continue to read in scripture, we see God's presence coming closer and closer to us. Now, there were two significant physical places where God's presence came and lived on this earth. And the first move we see God make to restore that relationship, to live among us, to live in our presence, was in a place called the tabernacle. It was a place called the tabernacle. He asked his people, the people of Israel, his chosen people, to build him a place where his presence would dwell. And it was called the tabernacle. And, and we, we hear about this for the first time in Exodus 25. God says to Moses in Exodus 25, 8, have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. If you're taking notes, if you have a Bible, underline that word dwell. That word dwell is going to come up over and over again in our time together today. Like I said earlier, God wants to live among his people. He wants to dwell among his people. He has a desire to be with the people he created. And so he tells the Israelites exactly how to build this thing, this sanctuary, this home where his presence is going to live. He tells them what kind of materials to use, how big to make certain things, how to lay it out. He was very, very particular and very specific. And then after they finished setting up the tabernacle, it says that his presence came and filled it. And I want to show you exactly how this is described in, in the book of Exodus in chapter 40. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. What's amazing about this moment is that this is the first time since the garden that God's presence has been among his people. 
This is the first time. God's presence was not on the earth for these hundreds of years. This is the first time we see God's presence returning to earth and him living among his people. So for several hundred years of Bible history, God's presence dwells in the tabernacle. And the whole thing is mobile. So when they move, they take the Ark of the Covenant with them. They bring, they, they bring the tabernacle, they pack it all up, and they carry it to wherever they're going. Then, after Israel finally conquered the land that God had promised them, they basically set up shop. They, they set up home. They were finally home. And they, 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 and they took the land, they invaded the land, um, and they settled in it. And then we find that a guy named King David is on the throne in Jerusalem. And he builds himself uh, an incredible palace, a, a massive giant palace, bigger than has ever been built for a king before. But he starts to feel a little awkward because, you know, he's slumming around in this giant palace and God has a tent. And they're like, you know, we need, we need to upgrade God's digs here. This, this, this doesn't make sense. We need to build a place for God's presence that's more than just this tent that we've been using for hundreds of years. And so him and his son Solomon begin a seven-year-long building project where they're basically building what they called a temple for God, a place for his presence to dwell. And once they finished it, they dedicated it to God. They invited him into it, and his presence came and lived in the temple. And we see this happening very much in the same way as what happened with the tabernacle in 2 Chronicles 5, 13 through 14. It says, The temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud. And the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Now, there's something really important that you have to understand about this temple that's going to help you understand my whole message for you today, which is that the temple was the place where heaven met earth. The temple was the place where heaven met earth. If you wanted to be in the presence of God, you had to go to the temple because that's where his presence was. And so that's what, that's what his people did. That's what the Israelites did. If they wanted to be in the presence, if they wanted to pray, if they wanted to make sacrifices, they, went, they had to physically go to the temple. The presence of God wasn't just anywhere. You specifically had to go to this place, this special place, where heaven met earth. And during this time in the story, that was the temple. But it wouldn't remain that way forever. Because you see, God's prophets started to talk about a new temple that God was going to establish on earth. But it was going to be unlike any that they had ever seen before. And he was going to be closer to his people than he ever had been before. And this brings us to the fourth time that we see God's presence moving toward us. And it's the story you hear every year at Christmas. This is the story of when God sent his son, Jesus. And Jesus said that through him, God's presence and rule was coming to our world in a new way. Now remember, you might remember the story, the angel told uh, the Virgin Mary to name him Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. God was moving, his presence was moving closer and closer to us. And he was coming to us in the form of a human, a man, originally a baby boy was where he was, God was now establishing his presence on earth. And wherever Jesus went, the presence of God went, because he literally was God. In the Gospel of John, John kind of describes what was happening here. This is the very first verse in the book of John. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling, there's that word dwelling again, among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. God God became flesh. He became a human being and he literally lived among us. He walked among us on this earth. This was an amazing moment in the story of the Bible. His presence was finally walking and living among us. But this still wasn't the end of the story. You've probably heard the story. Jesus was sentenced to death and he was crucified on a cross and he was buried. And then three days later, he rose again. But why? You see, the reason that Adam and Eve were sent out of the garden in the first place was because they were no longer able to live in the presence of God because they had sinned. Sin entered the world and it entered their hearts. And because of that, they weren't able to be in the presence of God anymore. But now, because of what Jesus did on the cross, because he defeated sin and death, God's presence can now come and dwell in us. And this is the first And most exciting moment, we see God's presence coming closer because now he lives inside of us. We have been purified of the sin and death that was in our hearts. And we've been cleaned and now God's presence can come and dwell in us and we become temples. We become the place where heaven meets earth. And Paul describes this phenomenon in one of his letters to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 3.16, he says, Don't you know, don't you know 
that the presence of God, excuse me, that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst. You now are temples. You are the place where heaven meets earth. So now that we understand kind of what this means that God lives inside of us, I want to share with you three incredible truths that come out of this. Because it's not enough to just kind of learn this and have an understanding. We have to know what it means for our lives. So I want to share with you three truths that come out of this central idea that God is living inside of you. And the first one is this, God is with you. God is with you. Now it sounds really simple, and, but we forget it all the time. We forget that, that wherever we go, God goes. Much like the Israelites taking the tabernacle with them and, and carrying it with them wherever they traveled, you take the presence of God with you. If you have made the decision to accept Christ and put your faith in him, wherever you are watching this video right now, God is with you. God is with you in your room. God is with you in your car. Wherever it may be, his presence goes with you. There's a beautiful psalm that kind of describes this in, you know, in a very poetic um, and beautiful way. It's Psalm 139 and starting in verse 7. Uh, I believe, I'm not totally sure, I think this is David writing. He says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Now, why is this a big deal? It means that you are never alone. Even when you feel alone, even when you are physically alone and you have no one around you, God is with you because he never leaves you, because you have his presence inside of you. Even if you feel like nobody cares about you, if nobody sees you, nobody understands you, God sees you. God knows you. God understands you because he created you and he lives inside of you. When you really start to internalize it and think about this truth that God is with you, it'll change the way you live your life. It'll change the way you walk around. It'll change the way that you speak, the things that you say to others, the way that you live your life. So that's the first truth is that God is with you. The second truth is this, God is glorified by you. God is glorified by you. Now, there's a really important second part to this. So if you're taking notes, put in parentheses after this, when you obey his commands. God is glorified by you when you obey his commands. Now, this one is harder to swallow. God's presence being inside of us, that, that's something exciting. That makes us excited. That's, that's something to celebrate. That's a joy, right? But um, this is something that is a little bit harder to swallow and harder to admit to ourselves. But the reality is that God's presence being inside of us comes with a responsibility. It comes with a responsibility. You know, back in the days of the temple and the tabernacle, um, there were appointed what were called priests who were in charge of keeping it looking nice, of, 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 of taking care of it, of setting it up, of carrying it. They were in charge of that. And it was an important responsibility. They had a responsibility to care for the place that God was dwelling. It doesn't make sense uh, for us to use our bodies to dishonor him, to disrespect him, because the whole point of, of our lives should be to glorify God. Once again, Paul says this better than I ever could in 1 Corinthians 6. Starting in verse 18, he says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples, there's that word temple again, of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, Honor God with your bodies. What this verse is saying is that our bodies, our souls are valuable to God. He literally paid the price for him of sending his own son who he loved to die. You are valuable to God. Your your body is not your own. So don't destroy your body or your soul. Now, how do you destroy your soul? Well, basically sin. But I specifically want to talk about sexual sin right now. Paul specifically addresses sexual immorality. This includes uh, sex before marriage, doing any kind of sexual acts before marriage, looking at porn, masturbation, all of these things are using God to, are using your body to dishonor God. Honoring God with your body means not doing anything that you can't do while worshiping God. Ask yourself this, if you, if you can't listen to worship music while you're doing whatever it is that you're doing, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Because those two things don't go together. You can't worship and look at porn at the same time. It just doesn't work. 
In Colossians 3.17, it says, Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This means that literally whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Whatever you do with your girlfriend or boyfriend, do it to the glory of God. Whatever you do in your schoolwork, your homework, do it to the glory of God. Whatever you do online, do it to the glory of God. Now listen, there is a whole message, a whole message series here uh, about the effect that uh, sexual immorality, the effect that it has on your body and your soul. And I can't really go very deep into it right now. But what I just want to leave you this, what I just want to say is that there are few things more harmful to your soul than sex outside of marriage than any kind of sexual acts outside of marriage. And I'm gonna leave it at that for now, but if you wanna hear kind of more about why this is and what this looks like, I would encourage you to reach out to your life group leaders. Reach out to people that you trust in your life if you wanna kinda understand what this means, the, the power of sex and the impact it has on your heart. All right, so let's bring it home. The third reality that I want you to understand about God's presence being inside of you is that God is working in you. God is working in you. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18 says this, Now the, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed, underline that word transformed, into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. There is a lot of hope in this verse, in the idea of being transformed. Because none of us is perfect. Even though we have been saved and rescued from sin by Jesus, sin is still attractive to us. We, we still struggle with sin. We still struggle with desiring things that, that, are, that are harmful to our bodies and to our souls and aren't glorifying to God. But the power of God, the power of the presence working inside of you, is that he is transforming you to look more like Jesus each and every day to be more loving, to look the way that Jesus did, to be more loving, to be more forgiving, to be more generous, to, to pursue peace in our relationships. These are all things that we are not naturally good at as humans. These are things that we are naturally bad at. But the power of Jesus, the power of him defeating sin and death is that we now have a role model for how to do it right, for how to love people well, for how to be generous, for how to be um, sacrificial to others. We can't do it on, on our own, but God is with us and Jesus is with us. And he has already won the battle for us. So to review, I want to just kind of go back through the points. God is living inside of you. Therefore, God is with you. God is glorified when you obey his commands. And God is working in you. I just want to leave you with some final questions to think about, um, uh, you know, during your week or even right now in this moment. The first one is this, how much do you feel God's presence? How much do you feel God's presence in your everyday life, in the things that you do? You know, right now you might be stuck in your home, but you're still doing things. You know, how much are you, are you feeling God in those moments? And then is there any part of your life where you're trying to go away from God's presence? Even though God's presence is the thing that heals and it's, it's definitely better in the presence of God, there are areas of our life that we don't want to allow into the presence. So pray that God would reveal sins to you that, that you have had in your life that you need to repent of, where, where God's presence can come in and heal, and where you, can, where you have room to grow and room where you can look more like Jesus. And then finally, is there an area of your life where you want freedom this week? Like that final verse said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You have the Spirit of God living inside of you, and therefore you should be living in freedom. If you're not, you're doing something wrong. Something is wrong in your life and in your heart, but it doesn't have to stay that way. And so we are here for you. All of your leaders are here for you. If you need prayer, you can comment below. We would love to pray for you. Just let us know what's going on in your life. I know this is a time when we feel isolated. We feel alone. But the reality is that, that we are never alone when you are in the body of Christ. You, you have a community that is with you and loves you um, and wants the best for you. And so thank you for uh, just giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. I hope that was encouraging for you. Um, I hope it gave you some things to think about, um, maybe some areas in your life that you need to change, things that you need to do differently. But however it affected you, I'm just so glad that I got to um, be with you during this time. Um, I love you. I, I miss you. I can't wait to see you physically together again on campus whenever that is. Um, but until then, I love you. Have a great rest of your week.